Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the JWB Dynasty Digest, where you view consumable Dynasty perspective. He's Skyler. I'm Wyatt. Tonight, we are joined by the boys from Dynasty Points, Thomas and Jacob, to talk about some of the more interesting wide receiver rooms that we just got because of a couple free agency moves that have shaken some things up. We're about to roll this intro, and while we do, make sure to like and subscribe. If you haven't yet, it'd mean the world to us. He has the hearts of a lot of fantasy players. I like it a lot, honestly. I like I'm I'm in for death taxes and the 2022 wide receiver class. I like what you were saying, Skylar. No, no player is completely untouchable. I think you guys really. I had not. I have not really heard this yet. I listen to a lot of pods, and I have not heard this yet. Well done, gentlemen. I'm really impressed. Boys, it's exciting to have you back on the show to talk with us. Uh, Jacob, how you doing? Doing great. Happy to be back on the show. Thomas, how are you? Oh, phenomenal. Was that a little spaceman I heard in the it was space in man. the intro? Oh, yeah. Shout out spaceman. Uh love that. Miss you. Happy to be back. Been we tell long. we tell every guest, Thomas, if you want to be in the intro, oh. you just have to yep. one up spaceman soundbite. So I will <laughs> oh, I'll cut a wrestling promo, baby. You don't even <laughs> oh yeah. Like, you don't you don't want to get me going. I'll I'll do it. If you ever want to just, you know, go right into one, we're not going to stop you. But we've been asking our guests to bring us a player to buy. Give us your pitch. Right. And you two are a couple of overachievers. Each wrote in two names. So I'd True. like to jump right into I had to decided these. which one I wanted yet. So I figured I would just log two and then figure you it out. You got two we there. If you want to give us one, you can go for it. If you want to give us two, you can go for it. I'll go to Thomas first. So you got time to decide what you want to do. Okay. Thomas, talk to us. So I have two because my second one is real easy. I'm just going to start it. My The one I had listed second as an overachiever is Sam Howell, simply because I feel like he is going to fall into QB ambiguity. And the last couple of years, that has been profitable. It was the first year of Geno Smith. We've had Baker Mayfield. We've had Jordan Love, Brock Purdy himself, all QB purgatory guys who might get a chance to start, might get a chance to play, and is on a fairly good offense that is cheap. Very, very cheap. Sam Howell is going to be an 11th to 13th, 14th round startup pick. You just want to tab those guys on your bench and just hope they get the chance. Regardless if I think Sam Howell is good or not, uh, that's that's just my, my quick one. My second one, boosted a little bit by the news, I wrote an article that you can find at fantasypoints.com called Three Undervalued Veteran Dynasty Assets. Samir White was one of them. This is a guy that in the LDD role for the Raiders was very successful. Granted, he doesn't give you a lot in the passing game, but volume matters. Uh, from weeks 15 to 18, he ranked 7th in expected fantasy points per game and 10th in fantasy points per game on a team that's going to run the ball a ton. It's just going to be volume, volume, volume. And if you like giant jacked, running backs this this is your guy i mean this guy is the upper half version of mike davis just hopefully yeah. more productive yeah how about those biceps in that in that latest conference uh, right. press conference country uh, thick for sure oh a thousand percent <laughs> uh but thomas so i mean samir white like the only thing now at this point is we have to fade the draft the nfl draft right like we got past all the people mm -hmm. we really care about with free agency, Alexander Madison signs today, which you're like pumped about that. If you have Zamir White on your rosters, that's not a threat at all. It's just the draft at this point. But I want to ask you real quick about Sam Howell. Is this a you think at some point maybe Seattle's not having the year they hope and he gets some playing time because of it? Or is it a we know Geno Smith is probably getting this year, but Sam Howell could be their future like they'll give him a chance after that? What do you think? It's neither of the two, really. Like, I think it's Geno Smith's job to lose. His contract was negotiated to a way that he has dead cat money in 2025. So it's not like he's just gone with no consequence. However, there is a world where um, maybe Gino goes down. He needs a break. Sam Howell comes in spark plug type situation. He can run a little bit. Hopefully he doesn't continuously turn the ball over constantly. Like I think this is Gino Smith's job until He's just not there anymore. Like after 2025, there's no contract to worry about whatever. They don't resign him at 35. But being that confident in one player leads me to think that I need a fallback plan. And with Sam Howell just being that cheap, there is still a world where he sees the field this year. I don't think it's likely because I think he's terrible. But for the, the price of the risk, 
this is just an easy click for me late in drafts. It, it is a no no cost really. Skyler, do you have thoughts on this? Um, well, with Zamir, I just want to clarify because a couple weeks ago we talked about Zamir White and we were screaming like to sell this guy before we got into free agency. Like if anyone was willing mm-hmm. to give you a second round pick, like run away with it. But now I am with Thomas on the exact opposite side where if anyone is willing to trade him to you for less than a mid second, like either right in that late, late second or early third, I'm absolutely buying in here on Zamir White as Thomas said, it's just all about the volume. I mean, at the end of the year, they were very content getting 20 touches and he was getting some receptions. They weren't going for a whole lot of yards, but it was better than nothing. It was more than I was expecting after what he gave us in college, which was essentially nothing. Um, and exactly what you said, why Alexander Madison signing should just be seen as a green light. Like if anything, it's a body that can do everything at a mediocre level, which is exactly what we love in our backup running back because it's not someone that I expect to actually threaten. And with this draft class, I just, okay, they take a guy day four. He's really going to have to earn that spot. And even then, I think it's a committee and there's going to be time to weasel out of Zamir White at worse for a minimal loss. So I'm actually in here on Zamir White if your league mates are seeing this as the sell window. I, I, I'm actually, I'm, I'm in now. Uh, things could change, but I, I think it's low, uh, entry cost entry and it's a body that could fill that rb2 spot i know we say it's really cheap to fill that in season but sometimes opportunities come where you can you can plug it a little earlier and uh this is one of those for me jacob thoughts on these players from thomas and why don't you uh roll into yours after that well i agree with everything you guys said about zamir white in terms of his likelihood of making it to week one unscathed Uh, i'm i'm just not a fan of the player like his really one of the least efficient called running backs we've seen in a long time. I understand also that he had some massive uh, knee injuries in his uh, sort of coming up through high school into college. And so maybe through this time in the NFL, he's been healthy and sort of put that together. Um, You know, I'll I'll definitely admit he looked better to me at the end of the season in that short little audition than I thought that he would. Uh, I'm still going to be struggling buying a player I don't really fundamentally believe in um, in terms of him elevating beyond just the guy who starts the year with touches. Um, ironically, kind of, I feel similarly about him to the guy that's now in his backfield, how I felt about him kind of last year as a guy where it's like, yeah, I believe that he'll get the shot. I don't really believe he'll do much with it, but you know, there's going to be tons and tons of these guys, uh, right now from, you know, Samir White to the Bengals guys to Chuba to single, like there's so many running backs right now that nobody really thinks is like all that great, but who's probably going to have an opportunity to put up an RB2 season and who, you know, the whole market has turned against running backs pretty pretty decisively in the last two years. So it's, it makes me less against buying running backs. I don't believe in when the prices are so much cheaper. Right. So I feel like if this was like a few years ago, people get a little bit more excited about Samir White. They'd be like, Oh my God, look at the speed score. He's going to have all this opportunity. Like people would be do- sending crazy things and I'd be screaming sell, but we'll have to see what the market does. I I'm, I anticipate maybe getting to a sell point on him at some point, but like you said, for now, it still seems like he's priced in like the mid to late second range. And I, I really can't, um, get upset about that for a guy who I think what would you guys give it like an 80 percent chance at this point he walks into week one with a starting job so um, I'm, I'm it's hard to argue with that and how I mean I'm, I'm just like I think one of the best things you can do with your late round picks at any point in time is just taking shots on the quarterback position like I you know I don't I don't believe in Howell either I'm not a Howell guy but he, he has high fantasy upside in whatever stint he's playing games and you know he has several paths you know can get hurt Gino can get benched. Gino can play well enough that they go 10 and seven and they, and they lose in the first round and they don't want to bring him back, but he just won them 10 games. They don't have a high pick. So they like just turn it over to the guy that they just traded. Like there's all sorts of different paths for him to get on the field. Um, you know, you could mention Justin Fields in the same breath too, quite frankly, in terms of a guy who yep. not going to start week one, but like we know when he's on the field, he's going to score points. And Howell is like a mini fields in the sense that I think he has a lot of truthers in the fantasy community who really oh, want to sure. see him with rose colored glasses. And I'm not one of them, but I, I believe that those people exist, right? And so all of a sudden he gets on the field, he starts putting a couple games together. I don't think you'll find a shortage of people in your league who are going to be talking themselves into Sam Howell long-term, right? I mean, you already have people right now saying he's going to beat out Gino Smith in camp. Like, people like this guy. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll focus on one um, for my list, which is, uh, you know, I probably believe in this guy more than I should. Um, and this is like a very like high upside, high downside swing for me, but it plays into this quarterback volatility element, which is Will Levis. Um, I I don't really understand the price on this. So Levis comes in last year and has a very up and down 
start. He had some games. Uh, the Tampa game sticks out in my mind. Uh, the, there was one other. I want to say the Jacksonville game. Maybe that's wrong. A few games he was just like abjectly abhorrent. Um, but also has like a few games where he was completely exhilarating. You know, the start first game against Atlanta was one of the best games quarterback played all year. He has the big comeback against the Miami Dolphins on Monday night. And that's to me, like if we think about what we expect out of a rookie quarterback, like traditionally they are pretty bad. And he was mostly bad, but he interspersed a lot of upside in there. You look at like Kevin Cole has this um, model that he's put together where essentially adjusts quarterbacks, Bayesian outcomes based on their prospect profile into their EPA um, through each of their starts. And then he has a confidence intervals where sort of the likelihood that they hit each of these confidence intervals as a uh, fantasy quarterback, so to speak. And, you know, CJ Stroud, of course, leads the class, but at both the 50th and 75th and 90th percentiles, Will Levis is barely trailing Anthony Richardson. He's massively ahead of Bryce Young. And he's priced quite a bit behind Bryce Young. And not only is he priced behind Bryce Young, but he's priced currently behind Kirk Cousins, who has very little value upside as a 36-year-old. Baker Mayfield, who is, you know, interspersed is looking like a league average quarterback with looking like a CFL quarterback on a year-to-year basis. Um, so in terms of like what I'm, what you're getting with Levis, like he's definitely starting all of next year, which is pretty much half of what I feel like you can count on with like a Baker or a Cousins or a Stafford. But there's a possibility that he's starting for the next 15 years, which is just not the case for one of these guys. And to me, the opportunity cost, he's currently going at the 7-8 turn, right at the 1-2 turn in terms of rookie picks is like, guys, I just don't think really have a lot of upside. So to me, it's it's a, it's a free roll on a guy with a lot of tools and who now they've all of a sudden built this offense around with Pollard, with Ridley, with Hopkins already there and Spears uh, and a quarterback or a coach, sorry, who has been traditionally quite pass heavy and uh, played a fast pace over there in Cincinnati. It seems like that's the piece they put together. So to me, that's one of the big um, swings available. And I don't think we get a lot of chances to take big swings anymore in the market. Like look at where... Anthony Richardson went as a rookie. Look at where Jane Daniels is going to go this year. Like our ability to price upside, I think has gotten a lot sharper to the point that where usually these high risk bets um, are actually very high risk in terms of the cost you're paying. And I don't think that Levis is actually that high risk, even if, you know, we're not that excited or that sure of the likelihood of the success. You will love us for me is this quarterback that like, I didn't really believe in as a prospect very much, but I do recognize the high upside that exists for him and the profile that he has. And there's been quite often someone else who values him less than me. So I've kind of like cobbled together a few shares over the past year where the price was at a point that I thought was worth the risk. So I end up with having him on my team a few places. And like at this point, I'm not upset that I have some exposure to this possibility, this upside, especially with them doing all that they can to put weapons around him right now, like the way you hope front offices would do for any young QB. We're like, there's going to be no excuses after this year when we get, when he gets all these players around him like this. Um, Skylar, do you have thoughts on Will Levis? Yeah. I just do want to say where I agree. Maybe the entry cost isn't horrible at round seven, eight of your startup. If I'm going to make that pick, I want to have multiple picks in that range. I, I want it to be one of those situations where I moved back from, out of the fifth, picked up a seventh and a ninth round pick or something like that. And now I'm taking Will Evans with one of those picks. I don't necessarily love taking him and expecting much out of him. I like it more as like maybe an extra dart or in your existing leagues, you can go and, and find the cost. If you do want to buy into a guy who isn't as expensive as guys in recent years, like Mac Jones a couple years ago or Kenny Pickett last year were, um, which ironically, we, we had a video a couple years ago, might've been last year or two years ago where we talked about Mac Jones and Kenny Pickett. And we just said that there's a little bit of a fallacy in the market with people. When it comes to these young quarterbacks, people say, well, they're, they're young. So they value them over some of these veterans and age doesn't necessarily work like that in court for quarterbacks. I think 30, it doesn't, 30 isn't as old as other positions. If you're 30 and you're still starting most of the time, you've really proven yourself like a Dak Prescott, yeah. right? So your job is more secure and you can play later into your mid thirties. At least we saw, we've seen a lot of quarterbacks make it to 34, 35 before they've started to fall off. So I don't view 30 to 33 really is that old at quarterback. Cause I think you still have that two to three year window. We look at, and with these younger quarterbacks like a Levis or like we saw with Pickett and Mac Jones a couple of years ago, the job security is not guaranteed just because they're young doesn't really mean you're getting youth in your team because there's no stability there because the job isn't guaranteed. So that's the only thing. If I'm going to invest I, in Will Levis, I just want it to be an extra dart, not something I'm actually betting on. 
I agree with with a lot of what you said there. Like I, I actually think that one of the most overrated assets in Dynasty is the young quarterback who's good, not great, right? Like the like the, the quarterback where basically all we're getting from their youth is the is the security where we we and this is clearly not Levis yet, but the you know like two has been kind of my go-to example for this unfortunately for the last few years, but like he's a quarterback so clearly he's gonna be starting in the league for a long time. <laughs> um like there's no there's no doubt about that he's, he's clearly good enough to start in the league for a long time but like due to physical limitations due to just his actual points per game limitations like the, the elite ceiling isn't there so to me I, I always want to be buying the if i'm buying the youth i either want to be buying some level of uncertainty in the market which is like clearly what you're doing with levis right now and it's justified uncertainty to be clear um where people aren't yet sure that he has that longevity so not all the longevity is priced in or you're buying Okay, this guy hasn't scored a lot of points yet, but something about him, whether it's the tools, whether it's whatever, suggests that I think he has a lot higher production upside than we've yet to see. Um, for me, that kind of fits both with Levis. I, I'll stake my claim on this. I don't understand why he goes um, behind Bryce Young. I, I think that those are, are ordered incorrectly. I, I think with like we always talk so much about quarterback, about um, not being able to scout it very well. Quarterbacks are random. We're not very positive about our priors from college. Like to me, when I when I then when we then see quarterback who like especially from a fantasy perspective like a was really bad um from, from real life perspective and see like didn't rush at all didn't throw any downfield throwing ability like has a really poor offensive environment like i, I think it's like a five alarm fire on on bryce I, I would be i'm very willing to shift my priors on nfl sample versus college sample between those two thomas do you have any thoughts on will levis before we move on yeah i think will levis is a classic case of of prior lock take lock if you would a lot of people can easily point out the games where he looked bad without seeing the absolute insanity of his upside so there's a lot of well there is no upside with will levis well we've seen it already we've we've absolutely seen it twice so it's it's definitely there like jacob said on an offense that's not built to be archaic and send back to the stone ages we're not just ramming a running back into the a gap first, second, and third down in punting, right? As much as I, I'm not a big Calvin Ridley guy, it's obviously way better than Nick Westbrook Akine, you know, running running those other routes on the team. There's nothing but upside here. I don't even mind throwing the, the eighth spot there, honestly, even without a trade back type situation. It's just what are you going to draft the, the fifth wide receiver for your, for your team at that point? It just... I'm okay taking that shot. If I miss on it, I feel like as a good enough manager, you should be able to kind of get that edge on a later pick, kind of replace it. So I, I don't mind taking it. I'm all in on the, the Will Levis train. Look, Jacob and I went in together last year. All right. It was the first start. Jacob and I decided we were going in and we're, uh, we're, we're sticking this one out for better or worse. So I, I'm in. Well, let's jump into the meat of our show. Because we're going to be talking about some wide receivers, and we're starting off with Will Levis's new weapon, Calvin Ridley, where it seemed like everything was going according to plan for the Jaguars, where he was going to wait out that till that certain moment in time when he could sign back with them, and the pick would not advance to a second round pick. And then apparently the Titans came on over and said, "We're going to pay you ninety two million dollars over four years, with fifty of it, uh, fifty million of it guaranteed." Uh, and next thing you know, Calvin Ridley is a Titan. Um, but this creates this interesting dynamic between him and DeAndre Hopkins and which one we actually care about at this point, because I think they're not so different in terms of like what they could be giving to us and where they are in their dynasty life. Uh, Cause Calvin Ridley is much older than people realize he's going to be 30 during the season. DeAndre Hopkins will be 32. That's not that big of a difference to me um, right now on dynasty data lab. Calvin Ridley is wide receiver 38 DeAndre Hopkins, wide receiver 47. On keep trade cut today, Calvin Ridley, wide receiver 38. DeAndre Hopkins, wide receiver 60, being left for dead there. Uh, you look at what they wild. did in 2023. The, uh, uh, Calvin Ridley, 11.3 half PPR points per game. DeAndre Hopkins, 10.9 half PPR points per game. Calvin Ridley, lower target percentage for his team, but they pass more. DeAndre Hopkins, higher target percentage, but less passing attempts there. And now we have to sort through this. 
Thomas, how are you feeling about where these two are being valued currently? Which one are you interested in? Are you interested in either of them? Do you think Will Levis can support both of them? Uh, I want whoever's cheaper, right? Like uh, Calvin Ridley gets the money. He gets the contract, but he's, he's never, I shouldn't say he never, he shouldn't be your wide receiver one or two on your dynasty team at this point. Like, I think that was pretty clear. I think the absurd prices people were paying last year when Christian Kirk was most definitely the play at cost uh, for me it's going to be the same thing at cost, right? Like I think DeAndre Hopkins is going to be more than serviceable. I don't know what their roles are going to be to me. I just think it's a weird signing because they do a lot of similar things. So I'm not quite sure how that's going to work, but uh, I'm just happy taking whoever's cheaper and, and writing it out. But it's one of those things we can sit here and say, we, we like Levis. We love his upside. We love his upside. And then can't really sit here and be like, yeah, but I don't want his receivers. <laughs> Right. right, but I, I, I just feel like there's a thing with Calvin Ridley for people that really, 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 really believe that they're still gonna get OG Falcons pre gambling Calvin Ridley, and just has a come to realization that's just not gonna happen. But he also wasn't terrible, right? The right. back half, the back stretch of that year, I believe it was 16 points per game. Not this half PPR that I see on the show sheet. <laughs> I'm bringing us from the 90s into full PPR here, like just where we should be, but. Uh, the key, Calvin Ridley was still really good, even though Lawrence was a bit of a disappointment. Again, um, it's just I, I'm going to take my stab at who's cheaper here because I think they'll produce close enough. This this to me is very much the the Kirk Ridley. I'll take who's cheaper and and be okay with it situation for me. I, yeah. I'm totally neutral on the Ridley price, like where I yeah. see him going. Um, I, I'm seeing him right now, like in that uh, round ten range, and that's kind of where a lot of like veterans are going he's not my least favorite in that range he's not my favorite in that range um but i think it's a totally fine bet i think it's i think his year is probably a little bit underrated last year because it, he failed to meet expectations but i think some people have then taken that as like he sucks and he like definitely doesn't suck like you know well, that's um what I wanted, that's he, what he i wanted like, to point he was out quite good as he, a, he as, was like, good. as a real life player he just wasn't he wasn't he left him on the field. He last saw Calvin Ridley, but when he wasn't 2019 or 2020 or whatever the year that Calvin Ridley was really good. He wasn't that version of Calvin Ridley, but he was still very serviceable wide receiver. And you know, as much as I think they clearly like paid more than he's quote unquote worth, um, they had a gazillion dollars in cap space, and they used it to buy a really good player who is going to help them evaluate whether their quarterback's any good. So I'm not going to knock that move. Hopkins' price is insane to me. Like, I get that he's old and boring. He was good last year. Like, I think, like, really underratedly good. He's been good for two years. Um, like, he had he, he had a step back as a target earner two years ago in the uh, – it, it was the year that he well, – he missed some time with an injury, and then he missed, like, the rest of the season with the injury, and he was down in, like, the low 20s in targets for a run for, I think, pretty much the first time since his rookie year. And then he comes back last year – he gets suspended. He immediately goes ham, like as soon as he comes back. And then late in the year, his production trails off. He's playing with like Trace McSorley and a bunch of total goons. But his like underlying peripherals were still really strong. He goes to Tennessee last year and he kept it up. He had over two yards per route run in one of the worst passing offenses in the league. Um, and had a 26% targets per route run. This is like vintage DeAndre Hopkins numbers. I think he's lost some of the explosion. In, from years past and you know at any point in time with him like the bottom could just fall out but we're talking about like he's going in range with guys who certifiably suck like the wide the, i just checked the wide receiver he goes next to is quentin johnson like come on people but that's that's nuts he's i mean he he's coming into an offensive environment that i think people just see titans and they think gross but if you just think quarterback with questions in the bengals offense like the upside there is fun. Like maybe Levis sucks. He derails everything, but I don't think that the ceiling is capped. I think he's still a really good player. I think he was a better player than Calvin Ridley last year. I'd obviously rather have Ridley in dynasty because of the age, but I, I do think Hopkins is one of the cheapest. Like if you're playing in the start 11 league, you can just acquire like 12 to 13 points per game for nothing. Like I think he's a really strong option to do that. And if Levis really takes a step, I don't think it's like crazy that he could score 15 points per game. Like his underlying peripherals are not that different than like a Keenan Allen, for instance. Um, it's just he was playing in such a uh, run-heavy environment. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm with you guys. I, I like DeAndre Hopkins' cost, especially if you're getting closer to that keep trade cut cost where he's wide receiver 60, which is just like patently absurd to me, uh, wild. Um, you know, and like... It's classic Ryan, ageism at this time of the year is what it is. If you look at his first down yeah. per route run, which if you go and check out Ryan Heath's article over at fantasypoints.com, company man, uh, where he just pointed out that f- um, first downs per route run is uh, better statistics than yard per route run. He's DeAndre Hopkins ended up just behind DK Metcalf, uh, right above Chris Godwin and Stephon Diggs and Michael Pittman Jr. Last year, when you account for like minimum 75 targets and 10 games played, like you really got to sift out some of the, the weirdos that pop up in those data brackets. But even if you thought he was hashtag bad, like he still produced at some elite grades higher than some of your, your favorites. So the price is just unjustified. Thomas, let me ask you, if you're going out to acquire DeAndre Hopkins on your team, yeah. what's the price you're looking to pay? Uh, oof. I would I would happily part with like a late two if I had to. Yeah, yeah that's, that. that's to me the totally fine yeah. graphic value. I would just rather like sell someone a dream. You know, I'd rather sell someone the, like we just mentioned Quentin Johnston, right? He just got like a nice little situation thing. Like that's, that's a move I would, I would totally make. I would just so see if, oh, hey, like you want Quentin Johnston? Like I, like I would, it's nice. It's, it's hard for me to sell the complete unknown, right? With the late two, because there's going to be interesting guys in this class. But any of these, like to me, like pseudo upside players oh. and you could uh, like, and these kind of young guys who, haven't really shown anything. If you could sort of sell someone on there in Hopkins or just to, like, he's going to be a guy that in almost any trade I make this year, he'll be like one of the guys that I'm just scanning the other team's roster to be like, I wonder if he'd throw in Hopkins and I throw in some other bum and, and would that really change the trade or would he still be willing to do this? Um, that would be kind of the way I'm attacking it. Jacoby Myers, right? Michael Wilson, Rashid Shahid, right? Jahan Dotson, guys that some people still actually have hope yeah, in it's not a best but... ball league then like when are we starting these guys ever right like, yeah, exactly. like a, i'm looking at dynasty dynasty data lab and i see romeo dube sitting at wide receiver 43 and think like if i can trade it's him to deandre league. hopkins and get something on top like i mean i would happily take deandre hopkins over him but you're telling me like looking at this i could possibly get something added on like i'm definitely in yeah especially with this is peak ageist season Right. Like that's important yeah. to remember. This is going to be the cheapest right. time because by week one, if he even shows a preseason game where he, you know, pops up a little bit with Will Levis, you know how dynasty players react to that. They, they're all going to clinch up right now is peak right, age guy, season. Right. A guy like Dobbs is like total is like fake upside. Right. It's like, okay, like he's young and he has this good environment, but like we've seen him play for two years. We've seen him earn targets considerably worse than every other wide receiver on the team. Right. Like on a, on a per route basis, like Reed is better than him. Watson's better than him. Wicks is better. Than him. I understand that there can be questions about each of these guys because they haven't been consistently full-time players. But like, if you're, you know, if, if you're just envisioning all the season, all the ways that this Packer season plays out, like there's stories you can sell yourself on how almost any of these other guys, like, came to a ceiling that was higher than we anticipated. But like we've seen Dobbs run all the routes already. We've seen it for two years. Like it's it's not it's not gonna happen. Right. Like he's like he can be he's gonna be a flex play and that's fine. But the, in terms of like this guy's path having like to starting like it's him being on the end of your bench for the next five years is is like fake upside to me. There's no there's no impact there. Completely agree. Yeah. Uh, Skyler, do you have any quick notes before we move on, or do you, are you happy with that? <laughs> no, I, I don't need to add a whole lot. I, I'm in on DeAndre Hopkins. I mean, you can get him as a toss and do a lot of deals. Exactly what Jacob said. Sell him the dream. Someone on the end of your bench, Romeo Dobbs is the perfect name to kind of throw in there. Um, a guy definitely you can toss in as a contributor. I, I, I'm I, not that interested in Calvin Ridley at his price. So you just look at target shares. I mean, DeAndre Hopkins had over 27% of his team's targets last year. I mean, even if that passing away goes up a little bit, uh, Calvin really is going to really going to have to come in and make a huge dent, which he's never necessarily done when next to uh, someone else who earns targets historically. So buying in a Calvin really expecting him to be uh, the better of the wide receivers is I, I'm not sure I'm quite there yet. Yes, he's younger, awesome. but he's not you guys young. All hop on Twitter. Oh. That guy loves Will Levis. Like he just <laughs> every, any opportunity. This guy's just like tweeting about how much he loves Will Levis. Uh, it's, it, it gives me so much hope. <laughs> <laughs> Let's also remember Calvin Ridley is in real life 25. 
right? Like he's not actually 30 in real life. He's 25 according to him, which is probably propping up, um, you know, some of that, some of that, that value. That was the story His... I told myself about Darren Waller. It didn't work out. Yeah, so well. <laughs> and I'm saying that about DM my own knees. Never mind. Really. Forget fantasy. If I just tell my knees that they're still 25, I might be able to get out of bed without groaning, <laughs> but not the case so far. It is just yeah. important to note because I know people listen to Dynasty Podcast and guys are like, go and buy this veteran. It's a great value. And then when it doesn't work, people are like, oh, no, how could I have seen this coming? It should also just be noted that if you are trading for these guys, you just have to accept that they might just die on your roster. Yeah. Right. Their right. tire could the risk. blow at any time. But that's why they cost what they do. Exactly. I just want to get it into the microphone. So right. when somebody plays this back and this doesn't work, they're going to be like, you know what? These guys said it was going to happen and it didn't happen. Yeah. It, it's expected. That comes with the territory. Just letting you the know. The Ridley Hopkins thing is, is a good example, but there's a million examples of this of like, you kind of want to, to me, like you either want to buy, you know, the rookies or whatever, but then like in terms of the, you know, or the, just the young studs. But once we kind of get into veterans, you kind of want to buy the guys where the market has already assumed that this is like their last year of relevance. Because at mm -hmm. that point, like you're paying a price that's so low that if you just rent their production for one year and they die, it's fine. And anything you get after that is a bonus. Whereas it's the guys that are like 28 where the bottom could drop out, but the market is still reflecting like three to four years. Because once you get past you know, they always talk about, there's like the legendary Adam Harstad article that I quote all the time, but like the, the idea of age looking like a slope, because when we average out production, you know, each year, the average production of that age group gets lower, but in actuality, that's not really how players behave. Like they don't actually have these gradual declines. It's usually like, they're good, they're good, they're good, they're good. They are totally dead. Yeah. So once you're into that period of time where the dead is, is possible just from age related decline, like to me, you kind of want to sell those guys right away. And then you want to buy them back once people are like, they're dead, right? Like I would rather buy a like extremely cheap, you know, like basically free Derrick Henry or James Conner or Aaron Jones than buy like a Barkley or a Jacobs where the market's like, yeah, they got a few good years left. It's like, maybe they do, right? Maybe they don't. James Conner has been priced like he's had one good year left for the last four years, right? Yeah. Um, and, and then it's like, you get your, you get your money's worth one year. And who knows how long that's going to keep that's going to keep kicking, right? Joe Mixon's like the same thing. It's like Joe Mixon is yeah is perpetual. Is he's going to be priced as though it's his last game in the NFL for every game he plays. For the the, the downfall career. has been yeah. written for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're we're passing yeah. out these two, but that was Adam Thielen and Tara Lockett for like the last three yeah. years. Um, yeah. Whereas yeah. Just you buy in here, but that's exactly when we're not sending two hundred eight for DeAndre Hopkins. We're going to try to yeah. finagle in somewhere else, and we are expecting Hopkins Lately. to die on my roster anywhere I have him. Yeah. I, I, yeah. He's, he's ending his career here, whether it's giving me points exactly. and ending that way or falling out and I cut him. So, yeah. All right. Let's move on to our next set of players, which involves another one of these older veterans. And that's Keen Allen, who after free agency kind of happens, starts to die down a little bit. He gets traded to the Bears for fourth round draft pick. Uh, he'll be 32 for the 2024 season on dynasty data lab. He's wide receiver 37 on keep trade cut. He's wide receiver 43 last year. Still at the top of his game, 17.3 half PPR points per game, 32% target share, just like the guy for that Chargers offense. It's coming into town where DJ Moore just had the best season of his career when he finally got to have some, I would say, average, possibly even below average QB play for most of the year. Right now, he's wide receiver 13 on C Data Lab, wide receiver 19 on Keep Trade cut he'll only be 27 so there is that age gap with these two as opposed to the last two players we were talking about when i see this happen i think the bears are doing an awesome job of preparing for caleb williams and i love this for him but it kind of makes me dislike everybody else that caleb williams is throwing to because if this his target earning ability will hurt everyone else around him and i don't expect Keenan and allen to get the type of target volume he's gotten in the past jacob how are we feeling about these two wide receivers and you know what's around them well, it'll be pretty fascinating because I, I can't remember. I'm not sure if I remember an example like this, maybe between like a rookie and a veteran, but between like a veteran and another veteran where one player is so much more valuable. And yet I would say they're probably like 50, 50 in terms of who scores more fantasy points this year um, between Moore and, and Keenan Allen. And I'm not saying that's wrong. Obviously like DJ Moore is going to play for probably five more years than Keenan Allen is going to play for, but it is interesting that like, if you just look at the last few years, 
it would be hard to come to the conclusion that DJ Moore is drastically better than Keenan Allen. Like Keenan Allen last year, arguably the second best year of his career, other than the fact that he missed time. But like when he was playing, was pretty much on par with everything he's done since I forgot what season it was that he was like the wide receiver three overall, but I think 2017 or 2018, he was, he was absolutely running shit. Um, I think that with Allen, where he's really going to succeed, I think is like Caleb Williams, such an electric playmaker, extending plays. And Keenan's just such a savvy veteran out there where he's, he's going to be that guy in the scramble drill to me, who's just going to be finding the soft spots and being that outlet when Caleb's extending plays in the pockets and looking for someone who's around um, on third downs, like Keenan Allen's going to be that guy who's going to know how to read the situation, know where he needs to be and, be and make himself available. I still think this offense is probably in terms of how they're going to design their first reads. I think you're going to want to prioritize more. He's the more dynamic playmaker. That's the guy you want to get the ball to in space. That's the guy who's going to threaten down the field, but his defense have to pay attention to more. Allen's a perfect compliment where I just think last year on this offense, you know, the secondary targets really Cole Komet as that intermediate short area option. And, you know, I've probably been too slanderous of Cole Komet in the past, but I, I don't think it would be slanderous to say Keenan Allen is a monumental upgrade over Cole Komet as that in that sort of role. So I think Moore and, and Allen really um, actually work quite, quite well together in terms of, I think, how they can design this offense. So I don't know that they're going to hurt each other. My hope is that they condense the targets um, and, and kind of crowd Komet out. Um, and, and the other hope is we'll, we'll see what they do in the draft. Right now, you know, they prioritize Gerald Everett in free agency. And that tells me it's a team that's going to want to pass out of 12 personnel pretty frequently because you don't sign Gerald Everett for his blocking prowess. <laughs> so that's the hope, right, is that, they, is that they're looking at this as a 12 personnel heavy team that those two wide receivers can really consolidate. If they go ahead and draft like Roma Dunze, now we have now we have a shit sandwich <laughs> on our hands. <laughs> right. For the time being, um, you know, I'm I'm pretty excited about both of these players and especially Keenan since he's such a bargain. It's not Tyler Scott season. <laughs> no, it never it might was. not be Tyler Scott season. <laughs> he, I, he, I had him on my taxi. I knew Mooney was gone. There's, now we got to cash in. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Yeah, I'm with you, though. Like, this is, again, where if I'm going to have to pick between these two players and their costs, I'm looking at the older player going with Keenan Allen here because, like you said, like, I do think it's probably a closer percentage than people want to admit. Like, who's actually going to have the better year on this offense? Uh, Thomas, how are you feeling? Sad. I feel very <laughs> sad that this happened. DJ Moore finally got the hyper-target Granted, he played with a QB that could find one guy, and luckily it was it was him. Is this like an extension of his time with Sam Darnold, which is what we really wanted? A guy that could really only go to one guy. Uh and, and you know, and he did often. And DJ Moore thrived as the wide receiver one and could have kept doing it. I had DJ Moore firmly back in my top 12 dynasty wide receivers, ready to go. Keenan Allen comes to town and I'm like, well, probably not going to happen now. Uh, you have to look at it like it's going to be a little bit more limited. I mean, maybe the big plays still possibly there. He's going to have to be way efficient on this. We know the whole rookie quarterback with multiple fantasy producing wide receiver stick. Don't know how that's going to go with this offense. And Obviously, how good Caleb Williams is or isn't, depending on what side of the coin you're flipping on. But it's bad. It's bad for both of them because we are taking two fantasy assets that were elite fantasy assets for production, combining them, and adding an unknown into the mix. It's not the best, most brightest situation that could have happened this offseason, but... Um, it's now just going to come down to, again, cost. So well, DJ Moore, I'll where he's this. going. Mm. I'll say this for the two wide receivers with the rookie quarterbacks thing. Like what Tom said is, is unequivocally true. Like that, that uh, historically rookie quarterbacks are supporting, you know, zero or one um, solid fantasy wide receiver. But, you know, think about who takes and starts rookie quarterbacks immediately. Like usually really bad teams and, Usually teams are really bad because they don't have two good wide receivers. Yeah, and I, I, by virtue yeah, of taking a rookie going. quarterback in the first round, that usually means that they can't take a rookie wide receiver in the first round, right? And we all know about free agent wide receivers. They're usually pretty bad. So 
it's it's this situation that Caleb Williams is walking into. Like, not only do we think he's one of the better rookie quarterback prospects of the last while, but I can't recall a time that a rookie quarterback has come in to a wide receiver duo as strong as DJ Moore and Keenan Allen. I'm, I'm sure it's happened, but it's it's pretty infrequent, um, or at least as established, right? And, you know, we saw CJ Stroud, of course, like an epic outlier where he was able to support two guys that we didn't think of as particularly established as, as these kind of two young guys grow together. But um, I, I think that's that would be what I would hang your hat on is like, you know, if you go through and try to find a wide receiver duo that you think is comparable in skill to Keenan and DJ Moore for a rookie quarterback coming in, especially one as highly touted as Caleb Williams. Like I, I, I think it's pretty abnormal in terms of how strong this setup is. Yeah, I think some of it comes down to me with a little bit of the of the Shane Waldron problem. He left a lot to be desired in terms of some of the wide receivers in his previous gig in Seattle. He was a little bit, how is DK Metcalf just not focused more? How could they be using JSN this way? Was this Pete Carroll? Was it Waldron? Etc. So I think some of that, I think you're right when we look at like the hyper outlier in Stroud. Slowick's not going to be calling the plays there in Chicago. I don't know how this offense is going to run in Chicago. This is all new. So this is where, and partly why I'm a little bit concerned. We have Waldron coming in, set the tone of his offense. They sign Deandre Swift, which kind of hilarious given what they already have in their backfield. Uh, suck on that Roshan truthers. Uh, <laughs> and then you've got the two wide receivers now, with the two tight ends, I'm just not sure how the offense is going to work with a rookie quarterback as well. So this whole mix can go really poorly or really meh. Like the uh, the prices of all of these assets, aside from, I guess, Keenan Allen right now, is probably more at their upper tier maximum outcome. And for me, that's generally a sign that it's more likely to settle under and i'm not aside from caleb you obviously want to draft him no matter what let's be honest but that's where my i'm really gonna have a hard time deciding between dj moore and some of the other guys around him because it's it's not the situation i think we were all hoping for honestly i think a a lesser tier vet coming in that isn't keenan allen might be we might be talking about a completely well, different story but well this is a dynasty podcast i'll i'll say this you know, if, if the options were DJ Moore plus unnamed future 2025, 2026 rookie or free agent um, and Keenan Allen for one to two years or DJ Moore plus Roman Dunze, like I'm I'm OK taking like a slight short term hit on Keenan. Like That's they, true. they were adding someone right. This this team was loaded up for with sure. assets. This yeah. team had the first overall pick, the ninth overall pick and millions in cap room. Like they weren't. They weren't running into this season with Tyler Scott at wide receiver two. So could it have been, could it have been, you know, <laughs> could it have been better for DJ more than adding this target dominator in Keenan Allen? Definitely. But I also think it could have been worse, right? Like he, they, there's a realistic chance they could have drafted Roma Dunze at nine or, or maybe even move up and for neighbors or something like that. And yeah. that that player, you know, there's risk there, but there's also a chance that that player just walks on the field and is like immediately better than DJ Moore. Whereas Keenan Allen, probably not that, or at the very least, isn't doesn't really play the game the same way as DJ Moore, and is a is a short term obstacle for DJ. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what Chicago does at the ninth pick. I think them trading for Keenan Allen makes it so that they can go a lot of different ways with that pick now. Um, Skyler, yeah, do you have any thoughts on uh, thoughts on Allen or DJ Moore? Uh, no, I, I don't think DJ Moore really changes a lot for me. As Jacob said, there could have been worse things here, I think, for DJ Moore in the long term. And if anything, you're either in on this offense that they're building around Caleb Williams and Caleb Williams, or you're not. And that that maybe could change your decision here. But a whole lot hasn't changed for you, DJ Moore. He's been like wide receiver. He's been somewhere between like 12 and 24 in my rankings for what feels like 17 centuries. Um, and I think that's really appropriate. He's still in that range. Wherever you have him in that range, I think you can really argue it one way or another in terms of his range of outcomes. And then Keenan Allen. I like Keenan Allen a, a good bit more than DeAndre Hopkins, but a good bit less than Devontae Adams. And I think that's just kind of the mole with this this older wide receiver, right? I'm, I'm, I'm interested if I'm not sending a straight-up pick. If you're just watching this clip, go check out our DeAndre Hopkins conversation. I just don't want to send raw picks necessarily for Keenan Allen. But if there's a way to get him in a trade, I think you're going to 
get a year of usable usable production. Yeah, and if you want, just out of, uh, for reference, um, at least where I'm at in terms of if you're looking to shop, like I have Keenan Allen as the third last name in my early two tier. So like kind of right between an early two and a mid two. Um, in terms of some of the rookies, like, you know, this is all going to change, obviously, when we actually get to the rookie draft. But if we just go by sheer numbers, I'm just quickly counting in terms of the actual number rookie. I have 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Yeah, so I have Keenan Allen right now ranked between the 204 and the 205. Um Whereas I then have DeAndre Hopkins ranked, um, let's see, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I have him ranked between the two eleven and the two twelve. So that would be a reference point there. Love it. Well, Thomas, Jacob, this was great. Appreciate you guys joining us yet again. Uh, I think there were some really interesting conversations. But I want to give you guys some time to promote everything that you got going on. Jacob, why don't you go first? Uh, yeah, you can find my stuff up on Thinking About Thinking. I just uh, referenced my dynasty rankings. Um, I updated those literally today. Um, I also just recorded a podcast uh, today with Pat Crane and Davis Maddock. We do a consensus dynasty rankings podcast series whenever we get an update done. So we had that today. We had a pretty lively discussion about um, the, the Chiefs after Marquise Brown arrives there, about some of the rookie wide receivers, about Justin Fields and some more guys. Um also, uh, you know, I have two articles up already on the free agency, one sort of about some specific players, one a little bit more theoretical about how this recent reflections on the free agent running back market um, and how that kind of shifts, how we play fantasy and all of at least one more post wrapping up the rest of free agent signings and then uh, plenty of rookie content. And uh, of course, you can find me on Dynasty Points with Tom, which I imagine he's about to plug in two seconds. <laughs> Go for it, Tom. Yeah, you know me too, too bloody well. Obviously, you can find... Any bit of work that I'm doing at fantasypoints.com. Uh, very excited and happy to be there. And speaking of Dynasty Points, that's every Tuesday night at 8.30 Central Time. Me, Jacob, and Lucas Gilbert of the Full Tilt Devi Pod, we dial it up to the max for Dynasty content. I mean, the coming weeks, as we always do, just an insane run of guests. You're going to want to tune in Noah Hill, Scott Barrett, JJ Zacharies, and the guru himself, John Hanson, Graham Barfield more. And it's just nonstop leading up to the draft. You're going to want to tune in head over there, subscribe to the YouTube channel and do all things fantasy points. Appreciate it. Everybody out there. If you're not already following Thomas or Jacob on Twitter, you need to be doing so. Thomas is at L Noster Thomas. Jacob is at Jacob Sanderson. You can find Skylar at the FF Buffalo. You can find me at YP underscore FF. You can follow JWB at JWB underscore F. In the description of this video, you'll find the link to our free Discord. We're over 700 members strong. Conversations happening every single day. Dynasty trades, best ball, redraft, dynasty mock drafts. Everything's happening in there, and you can get in for free. Join the conversation. You'll also find the link to our Patreon for all of our cool bonus content. We are brought to you by Underdog Fantasy. If you sign up with code JWB, you get a first-time toss match up to $100. I appreciate all of you. As I said in the beginning of the show, if you're not subscribed yet, please do so. It'd mean the world to us. It's the best way to support us. Appreciate all of you. We'll see you next time.